I'm not sure if you're familiar with this image. This is the coronation of Napoleon Bonaparte. This is interesting to see that um, everything that was done in the Middle Ages in Europe, all of the rituals were done with very specific intent. And the coronation itself is not only what may appear on the surface on at face value as a, an obvious coronation of a monarch that is the sovereign of the state, but is really a psychological maturation process. And the power of ritual is not to be under yeah, overlooked or undermined or understated as an importance. This is one good motto to, to keep in mind and close to heart, especially with, with the intentions that we set for ourselves in the beginning. The coronation is not to be seen as something that we are adding to ourselves, something that we are acquiring or something that we're achieving or that we are in pursuit of something in addition. Rather, it is a process of shedding everything that is untrue, everything that is, so to speak, not serving on our journey forward. And when we let go of what we are, we inevitably free the space up for what we may become. You may observe looking at history that initiation rituals are very much alive, especially if we observe the ancient peoples which still live approximately in the same way as humanity lived before the agrarian revolution before we started to live in in large urban areas and before we started piling up reserves of food into silos which then became towers which then became castles which then became large cities to protect the surplus of food. And if we observe, for example, one of the most dominant places that still hosts a significant amount of tribes which live the same way, the same life in the Amazon basin, you see that all of those individuals go through ritual initiation a process of maturation. They go through different trials. They have different elders or shamans that guide them through the so-called spiritual journey. And those are done typically at specific milestones in life. For example, when a boy is about to become a man, or when a girl is about to become a woman. And this is something that I trust many, or if not most of you agree with me, is something that is lacking in our monocultural global culture that we all share. Those rituals are essentially, in my understanding, what perpetuates what I like to call the infantile stage of civilization. And why I'm saying this is because the coronation journey, the seven day challenge is built as an initiation ritual in itself. And as we'll move forward through the journey, when we will, when we will uncover stage by stage, process by process, we will reach at some point 
the stage, which is called the citrinitas or the yellowing, which signifies the Jungian archetype of the magician. And the magician is essentially the, the elder or the wise man of the tribe that is able to facilitate rituals and is the signifier and carrier of, of wisdom. All right. What is alchemy? I don't know about you. What I've been taught in school, for example, throughout my public schooling system is that alchemy is essentially a, a practice or even more uh, a medieval obsession of turning gold or turning lead into gold. It couldn't be far, farther from the truth. Um, this is metallurgy, yeah? We, we actually nowadays as a civilization came to a, a point in time where technologically we can actually make gold of different substances. However, the process in itself is not nowhere near to be cost effective in order for that to make any economical sense. But alchemy really is a science of knowing oneself. It is a process of reaching or creating the philosopher's stone. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the images of the Holy Grail, with the elixir of life or the fountain of youth. And there's many different terms, many different ways how we can uh, describe the entire process. However, to simplify it, the process of alchemy is dealing with the unconscious, the unconscious parts of ourselves, which become the so-called prima materia, which is the raw material, the primary material, which undergoes a specific process of maturation in order to reveal its perfected state. We could call that an art of turning base material into gold, but this is of course symbolical of the psychological processes that unfold out of this process. Alchemy has been throughout the Middle Ages in Europe, essentially built on the Hermetic tradition. And we can date that back to ancient Egypt. Alchemos means the black land, the land of Egypt, the land of Nile. And if we observe the monolithical structures, the pyramids, the temple of Man, and all of those occult sciences, we see that um, this knowledge is um, much, much older than, than anything else. In Europe, in Prague specifically, uh, during the 16th century, which is during the time of the Rosicrucian Enlightenment, there was a specific movement to revive, revitalize, and restore, or how Terence McKenna puts it, um, an archaic revival movement. Needless to say, that was unsuccessful, but still, all of the alchemical treatises and all of the books, all of the wisdoms that have been recorded, all point a finger to the moon. 
and are very richly, richly detailing the processes of the human psychology. Alchemy has al also is also known as the royal art. You will see the imagery that I use here comes from uh, Solis Splendor or the splendor of the sun. This is an alchemical treatise from the 16th century. And it really depicts the entire process very nicely. I, I believe that um, most of you who are already present in the first cycle have received that PDF email. So that's a, that's a good resource to dig into if you feel called to really go into the details of the subject matter. I will, of course, not be digging really deeply into this because it would take us a significant amount of time. So, as we said, the Philosopher's Stone, or otherwise known as the Magnum Opus or the Great Work, is what ancient esoteric alchemists were really in pursuit of. And that was the gold, the metaphysical gold. Um, one thing to notice is that alchemy is also at the core, at the center of what we nowadays have come to know as science. If you observe the alchemical laboratories, some of which are still up and running, it's possible to visit some still in the present day, you will see that those were the first laboratories, which are now those clean, sterile uh, laboratories in which scientific experiments are performed. But the, the medieval mind had a very different philosophy in mind and a different viewpoint, a different observation of how they perceived the, the great work. Because inevitably, all of the alchemists that were performing those experiments were inevitably transformed their, themselves. So the medieval minds did not distinct, did not make a clear distinction between mind and the matter. And that is also one of the objectives of the alchemical process, to merge the two apparently opposing paradoxical elements of life, the mental and the material. It's also interesting to observe, I've, I've noted down here, Isaac Newton. He actually created a recipe for obtaining the, the substance of, of the alchemical philosopher's stone. And it's possible to find it online. Um, but yeah, I, I, would, I would not go down that rabbit hole as, um, as we've uh, clearly identified that it is not the material substance that we are in pursuit of, rather we're in pursuit of transformation of self. So if it's possible to use this alliteration, to use this symbology of creation of something which is more beautiful and perfected, and compare this to, for example, the Übermensch from, from Friedrich Nietzsche, the perfected being. This is what we could call the deeper meaning of, of the spiritual practice. And all of the hermetic traditions in their many shapes and forms, which to the present day have been evolving also from different schools of magic, from the Rosicrucians to all the way to Aleister Crowley. And um, yeah, but all of those, all of those traditions, all of that culture is essentially built around the very same principles of alchemy. One good point here is, is also what I've, what I've shared earlier, that um, 
one of my intentions with with this process and with this practice is to to keep the wheel works spinning because even though that the achievement of this so-called holy grail is something that one might not expect to ever achieve but is still something that feels compelling enough to pursue in in daily life regardless so if we if we consider ourselves as the the base metals and the the primal instincts of man the primal instincts of, of a human being through this practice of spiritual maturation is the objective of of achieving this perfected state and and creating gold now going into the alchemical principles so beyond the apparent duality of mind matter man woman or feminine and masculine this is the the beginning of of the logical principle or the mathematical principle of two so when we merge when we achieve the union of opposites the inherent anima or animus meaning uh, according to jungian psychology our opposite selves of opposite gender when this circle is completed we actually define the first circle within the the great work which is the self area so to speak this is the first boundary which clearly defines our behavior and this is the mastery of self that we've been talking about you can see clearly through through this image the holy grail in the center the right hand side masculine solar power solar energy and the feminine principle of lunar receptive the alchemical marriage or the twin flames so to speak is a ritual process of coming in union with ourselves within deep within our psyche the second stage of alchemy we're now talking about the four corners so the four corners making a, a quadrangle we define the boundaries of law and by law we are not referring to man-made law here rather we're referring to natural law the so-called world area that could be interpreted also as west east south and north but it could also be interpreted as the four elements the four elements being earth fire water and air and you will see throughout the seven day journey that we are interchangeably using and combining the four archetypes and the four elements as principles of energies that we work with in order to go and push through each stage. This is also corresponding to Jungian psychology, the four archetypes. And those four archetypes are as many of you know, and as Sylvan was mentioning, um, as if somebody was not was was still having to catch up with some homework that that was not passed around, the king, warrior, magician, and lover. So when we are referring to the king, warrior, magician, and lover, we are essentially refer referring to the four corners of our psyche. And we will go deeper into this at a later stage. But essentially, if you look at the Jungian analysts and Carl Jung himself, you will see that um, the four archetypes can be a very, very powerful 
blueprint, a sort of a map to navigate the deeper structures of our psychology. Moving forward to the next principle, out of the initial two circle and square, we come to create a triangle. This is the, the Trinity unity area. And this is one of the most important alchemical principles, the law of three. This can be interpreted in many ways. And as you explore many religions, as well as businesses and uh, throughout the civilization, throughout culture, you will see that this number three appears in many shapes and forms. One way how to interpret this could be mind, body, and spirit, but it could also be in Christian religion, for example, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. From a, from a pure alchemical perspective, and this now also goes into the material realm, you will see that alchemy essentially corresponds to three elements, salt, mercury, and sulfur. Salt, now going back to the four elements, is something that you naturally see form in the natural world as a formation of earth and water. The salt actually represents the body of the philosopher's stone. It is the, the vessel, the container that contains the process of the great work. And this signifies the motion of action. Mercury, on the other hand, is the formation of water and air. Mercury is the spirit. It's the life force of the great work. If you look at uh, Greek mythology, you will see Mercury being the god, the messenger god. Mercury also corresponds to thought or mind. And just thinking, contemplating about the mercurial nature of that element, it is something that is unstable, it's volatile. It can, like water, it can assume any form given the container in which it finds itself. And that brings us to the third property or the third principle, which is sulfur. Sulfur corresponds to emotion. This is the volatility of air and fire. It represents the fire and air of the great work and can be also understood as the soul of the process. So if we make this very pragmatical, if you consider yourself entering on the coronation journey, you see that there needs to be some structure. The structure that contains and clearly delineates the boundaries of what we are setting ourselves to do. Within those boundaries, within that container, you work with your mind, with your thoughts, with your intentions. Those represent the spirit or the life force. This is the thing that undergoes the transmutation. And the emotions, the sulfur, that is what comes deep from within us as we move forward and inevitably comes up from the shadow aspects. So if you imagine two potential elements, Within, emotional, within the emotional space, 
it can be joy, it can be excitement, it can be bliss, it can be the so-called positive emotions that give you the energy to move forward, that propel you forward. But it can also be fear. It can also be anxiety. It can also be discomfort. It can be all of the emotions which are inhabiting the shadow lands, so to speak. So these are all of the emotions, all of the parts of ourselves that we are not proud of and that we would rather not to, for, for it not to be visible, for it not to be shown a light on. And it's crucial to, to, to note at this point that either of those states or polar opposites of emotions can be similarly powerful for us to move forward through any discomfort and to tap into that energy. We'll inevitably see tomorrow as we dive into the beginning, into the first stage, into the nigrado phase, what emotions will come up. And this will be the subconscious primal material with which we will be working with throughout the rest of the journey. So now if we, sorry, if we now observe the larger cycle, the fourth phase of the alchemical process, making again a circle, you will now have the stone of the wise, so to speak. And if you look at this symbol specifically, you see that it incorporates the small circle that we defined as the woman or man, sorry, the woman and man, the feminine and the masculine principle. We see the, the square, the quadrangle, which signifies the four corners of the world, the four elements, the four primal archetypes, within our deep psychological structure. We see out of that emerging the triangle, which represents the Trinity. And then we have again, a larger cycle, which encircles everything as a repetitive, ongoing, never ending process of death and rebirth of celestial movements and of everything that we may call different names, but it can also be called nature itself. The larger cycle, and this is something that uh, Laura touched upon in the beginning of this call, today marks the 14th of January. This in Orthodox Christianity is the New Year's. So Orthodox Christians today are celebrating New Year's, which marks the beginning of a new cycle. However, as I mentioned, because the Gregorian calendar and the Julian calendar are not aligned, there is some uh, mathematical error in, in one of them. And it's, it's, not the, it's not the Gregorian calendar that, that has most error. It's the Julian one. Why I'm saying this is because if you look at the right-hand side, December solstice. December solstice is when the sun reaches the southernmost part in its journey, relatively speaking, of course, observed from, from the Northern Hemisphere, at which point it reaches its southernmost point that means that the the night the night time is the longest the daylight is the shortest and it stays there for three days before it starts moving back towards the northern hemisphere which is christmas the 24th or the 25th of december and christmas if you really observe it from uh if if some of you are familiar with the with the christian 
mythology, the, the rebirth of Christ. Um, it signifies the return of the sun. So you will see that all of religious symbolic symbolism and, and mythology can be interpreted also as astronomical, astrological, or celestial movements. And those dates are very important because they also in pagan traditions mark exactly the times in which the most important festivals were held. So if, if any ritual intentions that you will decide to put into your habit stack at the end of the coronation journey, um, yeah, mark those dates. Those dates can be very powerful in terms of performing individual or collective group rituals. Okay, so this is a picture that represents, in essence, what we went through, uh, the completion of the great work. So you see how, how this corresponds to the yin-yang symbol, the feminine, the masculine, uh, the warm, the cool. The, the green circle represents the boundaries of our behavior, of ourself. The quadrangle, the square, represents again and delineates natural reality, what we call three dimensions. And the main elements being fire, air, water, and earth. As you've seen in the Trinity aspects, the, the alchemical law of three, if you combine fire, sorry, if you combine earth and water, for example, you get salt. So there is always an emerging property when working with those alchemical pr processes. There's always something that comes out and there's always, let's say, from musical perspective, if we put it in terms of music, we always go from do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. It's again a repetition of the entire chart and we reach the next octave. So that can be, if, if you're familiar with, with musical terminology, that can be a good way how to interpret the natural evolution of those cycles. Okay, I know that this has been a lot. Um, is there any questions up to now? I have a question, Alex. Hey, Austin. Yo, loving it so far. So thank you. Excellent. But, uh, the, the question is, uh, and I'm sure you've thought of this because you think of everything, but the fifth element, is there a fifth element um, that is able to encompass what you're talking about? And then would there be like a fifth archetype, like a hidden one too? Beautiful. Excellent question, Austin. Um, yes. Yes, absolutely. So if I go back, it's, it's not really clearly visible from this, but essentially the larger circle that encompasses the triangle, this is the emerging property, right? So if we, if we take, for example, the natural elements, fire, air, earth, and water, you will find that most traditions actually talk of the fifth element, which is oftentimes called ether. But ether in itself is not really an element per se. It is the, the context in which the content is in, right? In alchemical terms, um, ether is not used as, as an alchemical term. In, uh, in alchemy, we speak of the, the quintessence. And quintessence, etymologically speaking, means nothing else but the fifth essence. And quintessence, now connecting this with psychology, we could call that our true self. that answer your question? Awesome. All right, so if there's, yeah, if everything is clear so far, um, 
let's dig, dig into this one. Um, this one is very busy. <laughs> this is a chart that, that is absolutely busy. Um, but let's try to decipher it step by step. So if you look at the, at the core center of this, you will see that there are four triangles. You will see that on the north side, there is the crown signifying the king or the queen. You will see the shield and swords signifying the warrior. You will see the magic wand and star signifying the magician. And you will see two hearts signifying the lover. So if you consider each and every triangle, as an archetype, let's take, for example, the magician. The magician archetype, when not expressed in its fullest, can be projected outwardly as a, as a shadow projection. And what that means is if you look at the bottom left and the bottom right corners, you will see that there is a plus and a minus. This will represent a positive projection or a passive projection. In the magician state, the unrealized magician would perform in his shadow or her shadow aspect as a know-it-all. As I don't know if you guys are familiar with, with Rick and Morty, Rick and Morty, the, the cartoon. Um, Rick is essentially the magician, the know-it-all, the one who creates everything, the one who knows everything, the one who essentially is able to pick everything apart and point a finger to all of the faults. However, he has no guidance. He's not connected to his king. And the king is essentially the vision. It's the, the being, it's the heart. So you can, you can really observe each of those archetypical triangles as for example, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? At the, at the base of the pyramid, you will see that on this stage, you have the most, basic physiological needs while on the top of the pyramid on the top of the triangle you have the fully self-realized individual right so now if you join all of those four triangles at the center you see that when an individual is actually acting from his center piece from his center self it means that he or she is embodying all four of the archetypes, but not being identified with either or with any of them. Meaning that all of the energies of the king, all of the energies of the warrior, all of the energies of the magician and the lover are at the centerpiece. Yeah, so. If we take, for example, the warrior, this one is a, uh, this one really hits hard, hits home very hard, I think, in the collective history of, of mankind where we stand currently. I believe we have witnessed the warrior archetype in its most destructive. Yeah. So if you see the, the positive projection of the warrior, it is the persecutor. The persecutor can also be named the mercenary. That is a warrior that has full determination and is able to follow and withstand any, any hurdle, anything that is in his way. However, the, the persecutor or the mercenary has no higher calling. That warrior is not an of service to, to any king. He has no allegiance to anything but the short-term 
pursuit of let's call it money yeah on the negative side on the negative pole you see here written the victim the victim mentality if you think of and i will use this example very crudely but if you think of high school settings high school movies and the phenomenon of the bully you can see that this is a very clear expression a very clear projection of this archetype playing out through through the individual in a collective setting and one thing to note and pay attention to is that any bully any persecutor essentially needs to have a victim so those two pairs are polarly attracted to each other yeah so i, I think we can we can go into into the lover as well um as the polar opposite of of the warrior the lover archetype is essentially about emotion it's about i love to do something i enjoy life i take life as it is given with a full spoon and try to express and enjoy everything at its fullest at its basest level the shadow expression of the lover you see that um, it can either manifest in its positive as a as an addictive personality meaning that there is there is always a pursuit of something more it's it's never it's not never, never satisfied with anything or the impotence as a negative expression where because of the because of the fear of everything coming to an end an individual is unable prevented from enjoying life altogether so you can also imagine this as you see in the outer circle as two opposing forces because the lover contradicts the warrior right the warrior is the energy that signifies our preparedness to fight to stand up for something while the lover on the other hand is the energy that speaks about enjoying life about eating the fruit from from the tree similarly the magician and the the king are also in opposition because the magician signifies knowing right the magician's tool is reflection observing contemplating thinking analyzing and that knowing is in opposition to being to vision to having a essentially a, a centered focus in oneself and just being perfectly comfortable where we sit if you imagine a king or a queen on the throne sitting in the chair well if i if i call it a chair i don't i don't do it serve i, I do it a disservice let's call it a the throne <laughs> but the king is actually the true north right um the i am the i amness is actually when we come to full center so if we start from the outer circles of this image we see that through the lover what we love through the warrior what we want through the magician what we know is really realized only through the king or queen we are we i am does that make sense? Awesome. Yeah, so you can also see that each stage through the outer marks 
are signified by the alchemical stages, the albedo, the, the whitening on the lover side. And this is where we work with water, the element of water. So it's purification, it's pure bliss. If you imagine yourself being a dolphin, I don't know if any of you ever swam with dolphins. I have. And that was a purely, purely blissful divine experience. I would, I would say that dolphins are the more intelligent species on, on planet Earth, because if you observe dolphins, you will see that they're always highly social, highly intelligent beings, always at play. They're always playing. They're like, like blissful children that are constantly performing, constantly enjoying life. And they're living in water, which is a, an environment, an ecosystem of abundance. Now let's, let's leave exhaustive uh, and extensive fishing on the side for now. But just imagine the ocean always provides. It's really on the ground where scarcity comes into play um, outside of the fruit forests and, and the Amazon jungles, of course. So yeah, I just wanted to, to create a, a more clear picture of, of what elements really works with the lover and with the, the emotions and how this connects to the albedo stage, the whitening. On the other polar opposites, uh, the negredo, which is where we'll be starting tomorrow, it signifies the, the blackening. This is the, the shadows. This is the underworld. This is Hades. Our shadows inevitably dwell in the dark. And the element, interestingly enough, if you have a clear picture of what hell might look like, these are the flames, the engulfing flames of fire. So I believe that we hold as a, let's say as a Western collective culture, we hold very clear ideas about hell being somewhat underground with a lot of very hot fire burning all around us. So that's, that's also a picture I want you to, to have in mind as we, as we enter into the first stage of the alchemical process tomorrow because the nigredo and fire is essentially what brings up all of those hidden emotions, all of the scarcity, lack, fear-based, anxiety-driven belief systems. That's where they dwell, in the shadowlands. Those are the demons, those are the monsters under our bed. But inevitably, those are aspects of self. So until we invite them back to the table and acknowledge them for being what they are without judgment, we will not be able to integrate that into our whole being. Yeah? And that's, that's a very important point I want to make as, as we dive into the first module tomorrow. Okay, so we, we still have, I'm moving very slowly, but I think we're good on time. I don't really see time in front of me. Um, let me check my mobile so I don't go too much over time. It's 6.30. Ah. Okay. Whew. <laughs> <laughs> I need to work on my timing. Is everybody okay or should we speed up? Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right. Um I'll I'll thank you, Sylvan. Okay, I'll I'll speed up a little bit. So what that leaves us with is going through 
Nigredo going through the fires, the fiery pits. You can imagine Mordor and uh, the burning tower with the burning eye, the all-seeing eye. You can imagine all of the monsters being released from Mordor. However, they are washed away only with love in water as we go into Albedo. And this is the, the first stage of the alchemical journey where we merge the two apparently paradoxical elements of being. And this really signifies the, the union of opposites, yeah? Then we move into the third phase. The third stage is also known as Citrinitas, the goldening. This is the phase where the magician comes into play. The magician is, as we said before, is all about knowing. The element that we work with in this phase is air. Now, if you imagine, I don't know if you've all seen the cartoon series called The Airbender, the, the Last Avatar. I love that cartoon to bits. It's actually representing the entire alchemical journey. So if you haven't seen it, I strongly recommend you do. I think you'll love it. Air or wind. If you imagine a great falcon, a great hawk flying, soaring through the winds above the mountaintops, having perfect vision, knowing exactly what field mouse is running atop a field and it can dive deep and strike with precision. This is an image I want you to hold when you think about the magician. So crystal clarity, knowingness, reflection, contemplation, precise information, that is what Citrinitas really holds. This is the stage where we become fully centered in the limits of our belief systems and thinking. And when we begin to activate the knowing of objective truth, yeah, this might be triggering for some, but there is such a thing as objective truth. <laughs> Even though that we can only observe it through our subjective experience, um, this is something that comes to light throughout this stage. And this is an exciting time. It's an exciting time because this is a time that brings forth understanding, clarity. Um, it shines a light on all falsity, on all belief systems that are obviously rooted in, in, in false beliefs, in, in, in lies. Uh, it can also be very painful because we can recognize that our entire persona, our entire identity is built around falsehood. And inevitably, that that's means and signifies the crumbling of our structure, the crumbling of everything that we've held to be true. Um, some spiritual teachers of the East traditions called this a process of the mountain was first the mountain and then it was no longer the mountain, but then it became a mountain again. This is really speaking about how all of those perceptions are essentially dissolved away in nothingness. There's, there's a few challenges that come with this stage. And as you see, this is a stage that I you know, can uh, go and ramble about uh, for, for a long time because I've been associated with this archetype and this archetype has been really speaking through me for, for a very, very long time, for the majority of my lifetime, building the glass towers, the ivory towers and palaces of the abstractive or the abstraction, the, the symbolism and recreation of a perfect setting, which is completely disembodied. It's, dis, it's detached from reality, so to speak. It can also be interpreted as living at arm's length. This is one of the challenges. And this is a perfect um, segue into the king, the king and queen. The king and queen in its fullest are actually the ring that binds them all together, not in darkness, but in perfect unity. 
the king or the queen is represented by the trait of vision the vision of what the kingdom looks like what the future should be like the king is the generator um it's the the provider of justice the the one who sets the boundaries which the warrior then protects the king or the queen is signal symbolized by the rubedo the reddening stage in in alchemical tradition and this reddening is also what the philosopher's stone at least on its metal base level is uh, portrayed to be or represented to be a sort of a sulfuric red substance the red color is therefore a signifier of the coronation you might be familiar also with um with the hopi traditions uh the return of the rainbow warriors the rainbow warriors if if really put into this context would actually represent the warriors who have undergone all of the four stages meaning black white yellow and red you will also see during during our coronation journey together some of the images that really represent all of those four colors on a noble royal knights this is the stage in which we actually focus on integration on embodiment on grounding that we learned from the magician from the warrior and the lover grounding it into being this is the most i would argue the the hardest stage or the hardest part of the journey um i speak from first hand experience of course collecting endless knowledge in pursuit of endless inexhaustive resources of wisdom um all of that knowledge accumulated means absolutely zero if it's not actually embodied if that philosophy is not embodied and if we don't try to use that knowledge in our daily life that could also be called the better part of wisdom yeah or knowledge applied so yeah this is the energetics that that we talk about when we talk about the king or the queen energy this is also corresponding to the element of earth now if you think about earth this is somewhere where you plant both of your feet firmly into the ground this is the substrate that holds you and serves you and is able to carry you forward with stability right okay um you can also see now i i think i i portrayed the the picture this was really really a a, a huge let's say map to to try to decipher and to to touch upon its elements but uh yeah just let me know if you're okay with um with what was said so far with regards to this you can yeah okay perfect excellent yeah there there's a let's say a bonus understanding to this as well as we will dive deep you can then if you observe this blueprint through the behavior of yourself or through the behavior of other individuals other people in your vicinity especially loved ones or those that you know uh very intimately you can try to play around with with those energetics with those energy types and see what expressions are or most potent in in their in their being in their behavior you can look at the combinations now again pointing to wait i think there's ha yes i found it the laser tag okay <laughs> i love wizard toys um yeah so if you look at the this cross section 
So the combination of the king and lover or the queen and lover. Now imagine what kind of a what kind of an environment this combination, this pair would bring into being. Uh, this is the purely feminine, the purely well-being state. This is where you love and you are. Yeah, there is no opposition. There is only pure bliss and enjoyment of everything that is in existence and the embodiment of that. This could also be portrayed as a sort of heaven. Yeah. But uh, on the other hand, um, I think it was Trevor in one of the Telegram group chats uh, talking about how the king or queen energy um can be perceived as gaia as this larger goddess and this is this is exactly this expression so one of the ancient let's say most ancient traditions on on planet earth uh we could we could even call them the ancient civilizations before the change in sentiment you will see the minoans for example are a very good example um, the Minoans, when, when archaeological excavations and the analysis of that culture were taking place, they saw that they did not have any specific weapons, no traces of uh, conflict or combat. So it was like a pure, blissful, feminine, well-being culture built around the enjoyment of life and embodying of that. Yeah, um, This is also a time where most of the cultural religious narratives were surrounded around the feminine so the lunar yeah not not the masculine the logical but more the intuitive side of, of human being on the other side however you can see the magician and warrior combination yeah so imagine now an individual who is expressed in those two archetypes or most dominant in those two archetypes. This is the pure masculine confidence. Yeah. I want, I know. So action and reflection. This can be a very, very powerful energetic pattern to embody because this is what creates the power to punch through, to thrust through anything, through any, through any hurdle, through any wall that you might come across. You know how to deal with it and you by action just go and do it. So that is, that could also be described as the, let's say last thousands, last two thousands of years of, um, of the colonization of the Western, the Western civilization of all of the other continents and all of the other cultures, yeah, the subjugation because of the supremacy of pure logic, reason, confidence. That's the, the masculine opposite of the feminine well-being, right? Okay. Um, you can also see if you if you make a, a cross section here. That's what we did right now, right? So we, we try to make a cross section of the king and the lover on one hand, and we, we had a cross section of the warrior and magician on the other hand. Now, if we move diagonally on the other side, the cross section here indicates the right brain hemisphere or intuition. And this one indicates the left brain hemisphere or intellect and logic, yeah? So now try to combine the warrior king. Yeah? Think of King Richard the Lionheart, the crusader. Yeah? So he knows and he acts, he is. He acts from pure intelligence, pure logic, pure reason, and is unstoppable yeah? to some extent. On the other hand, we have the lover and the magician. So imagine a combination of loving and reflecting, of knowing 
and pure enjoyment. And you could easily correlate this to our intuitive capacities or the right brain hemispheres. Okay, last but not least, and then we'll, we'll close with, with this section. Um, if you now try to imagine all of the, all of the four archetypes joined together and see this as a pyramid, let's call it the, the Cheops pyramid in, in Giza, in Egypt, you will see that each side of the pyramid depending on the passing seasons and the movement of the sun, the pyramid in its essence is whole, yeah? At the top of the pyramid, you could see that that symbolically can represent an individual who fully embodies all four of those archetypes, all four of those deep psychological structures and is always acting in balance. It's as if this individual would be at the center of his mandala, yeah? When the sun is in apex, meaning that the sun is right above the pyramid, all four sides are equally, equally shown a light on by the sun. Yeah, this could be called the apex of, of the sun. There is no shadow elements. However, as we know, throughout the year, the sun moves in different directions. And because of the wobble of the earth, the sun passes through this yearly cyclical journey, meaning that at each specific stage, a different side of the pyramid, pyramid will be cast the light on in such a way that there will always be an expression of the shadow. Why I'm saying this is because if we consider now ourselves as this pyramid and our objective to always be in center with ourselves, life will always throw hurdles in front of us. Otherwise it would be boring, I think. Yeah, meaning that there will always be some shadow aspects. There will always be some, in brackets, imperfect expression of our being. However, knowing that this is a, a perfectly natural cycle, if we are always striving to be conscious in our response to whatever arises, and deal with what has arisen consciously, there is a, a significant amount of time between every stimulus from the outside and how we respond to that, rather than how we subconsciously react to it. Yeah? So that would be, for example, the distinction that I would like to make in terms of what the benefit of working with this, um, the process and, and the blueprints of alchemy would be and the ultimate goal of the alchemist. Not to expect that life will suddenly become perfect and there will be no more challenges in life, but that we will always be perfectly equipped to handle them with grace and with presence. Okay, um, that was a long one. <laughs> Moving forward, the, the alchemical cycle, and I will, I will just rush through. I know that um, we're, we're really behind time now. Um, you will notice that, and this is also why it's, it's a seven day challenge, yeah? Because each day will represent one of the alchemical operation. And each of the alchemical operations are subject to the four quadrants of the cycle that we now just touched yeah so the blackening the whitening the yellowing and the reddening um and as as sylvan probably noticed now there is also an emerging next property which is the eighth and the the eighth octave would be in our case the integration part 
the embodiment type. Yeah, so after we go through all of those stages, after we go through the entire process, it's time to slow down and just be and let all of this experience be absorbed, digested, and we drink plenty of water and, and learn to breathe so that we can really come to center with ourselves. Okay, so the, the key takeaway, um, I was mentioning before the red lion, you will see, and I will talk about this, I will also share this in, in, in each module. Uh, if you're interested, I can, I can share more images if you, if you are more of a vid visual type. Uh, but the lion, the red lion is ultimately also in Prague, the signifier and the symbol that represents the end stage of the reddening, the rubedo. So the coronation ends at the foothills um, before the entrance to the Prague castle. And you will see there that there is also a red lion uh, decorating the, the building just opposite to that. Nowadays, there is also a very popular uh, touristic restaurant there also called the Red Lion. But yeah, that, that's, that's the mundane element of it. And yeah, I would also love for everybody here to, to be able to join me in an alchemical exploration of Prague, because um, all of this that we've just now uh, gone through all of this material. If you are able to observe this symbology in its architectural composition and how everything is built, the entire coronation journey, I think you would all appreciate that and love it. So yeah, let me know if, if anybody is up to coming to Prague. I would love to host an alchemical journey and uh, exploration of Prague. Not to go on a tangent, uh, the Red Lion. This is also, um, if, you, if you open up uh, Wikipedia or Google, and if you type Richard the Lionheart, you will see that this symbol decorates his armor. Yeah? So this is the, the flag of Richard the Lionheart. And as we've, as we've seen in the previous deep dive, this is a typical um, exemplar of the king and warrior archetype. Yeah? Now consider this, if we, in many cultural expressions and mediums, you know, imagine a fully embodied king as King Richard the Lionheart, I think we're doing ourselves a disservice um, because a fully integrated individual is actually the one who is wielding all of the artifacts. Yeah? It's a symbolic correspondence <clears throat> to a fully integrated sovereign human being. And that means that we are capable of loving, we're capable of being and ruling, we're capable of fighting, and we're also capable of knowing. It would be really awesome to, to have, as we go further, if you feel called to it, to find or identify any object, any artifact that speaks to you in, in terms of symbolic representation of a specific energetic or a specific archetype that is a, a part of your intention that you would like to call forth. Um, yeah, to, to select an artifact and keep it close to you. You know, it's like a talisman. I think those can be very powerful, very activating, because whenever you decide to put on your war paint, yeah, like some traditions do, you inevitably become subtly, but consciously more aligned with that energetic expression. So yeah, find, find that whatever in your near environment could symbolically represent either all four of those or just one specific one, if, if that's your intention to, to work with that specific energy. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll just finish with, with this framework. 
So this framework will be very useful as we move forward. Um, so what happened to this? Oh, okay. So this is a, a very powerful image, I think. Um, if you try to compare it to Christian symbology and the cross, and you can imagine either Jesus on the cross or you can imagine this Aztec skull. But what this speaks to me, the symbol itself, is the embodiment of all of those four archetypes and all of those four alchemical stages that an individual goes through in order to find himself in the center. Yeah. So this image could just as easily be representing your fully centered embodied self that carries along all of the frequencies and all of the energies of the four stages, of the four elements, of the four archetypes. So this is the Holy Trinity. This is the, the Philosopher's Stone. Yeah. So before we finish, just to, just to sum it up, alchemy, in my mind, is a journey into the unconscious, into the subconscious. And our aim is to unify the unconscious with the conscious. That is the union of opposites. 